forces, um, especially here on the right flank, are not very well supplied with uniforms. We're in uh, the frontier, a lot of civilian clothing.
and there he goes. Fighting ends and the men march back to the American camp. The other side of this British troops come back and are dismissed on the parade of Fort Niagara in front of the old French. And they'll have actually primed the pan from that car seat before they do that. They'll then cock it and on command fire it together. And the reason they fire in a volley is because of the inaccuracy. If you get everyone to fire in a mass volley, you're putting more ball in the direction of the enemy and a better chance of hitting somebody. Somebody is going to hit that block of troops if you're close enough, eventually. So the whole weapon system develops linear tactics as you're seeing the men march out, especially the Americans on the attack. They're coming out in, from column into line. The line is going to move into range and they're going to be firing by volley. And of course, the crown troops that are in the fortifications will be firing in volley in response, but they're well protected behind the earthworks. You can see well-trained troops can develop a very crisp volley. The men, having been drilled eight hours a day in close order drill and climate waiting, uh, Professional troops, like the British soldiers here, and for that matter, the American Continentals, they could get off four shots a minute, one every 15 seconds. So the idea of the 18th century was to turn your unit basically into a machine gun. In a major battle, a full regiment of troops would be approximately five to 600 men, and they'd be broken up into 100-man companies. And then you'd either fire them all together, or you'd fire them by company. So if each company comes into line, fires, you're sending 100 ball, 200 ball, 600 ball at target, and hopefully somebody is going to get something. What is going to watch to see if the fire is effective? So linear warfare is determined by the weapons, but again, you're firing at extremely close range, and you need a secondary weapon because these weapons are unreliable. Black powder is hydrostatic. It also produces a tremendous amount of smoke, as you can see right now. And we're very lucky that there's a nice onshore breeze from Lake Ontario because it's blowing the smoke away. Otherwise, we'd be in a fog of war and this battlefield would be smothered in black powder smoke, making it very difficult for the officers to see what is actually going on in front of them. So, if you're going to have a battle in the 18th century, you want a clear day with a breeze. I was saying that black powder is hygroscopic. It means it absorbs moisture out of the air. And eventually, the fouling builds up. It's a thick, gooey, sticky mass that's going to start clogging things up. The touch hole is going to be the first victim, and the gun's going to stop working. Eventually, even the barrel can clog up, and you can't ram your ball down. So black powder is a very, very dirty, dirty substance. Uh, and it's going to make the gun very unreliable. So you're fighting at close quarters, you need to have a backup weapon that you can actually use. And that is the stock. So that each of these soldiers are carrying either on their waist belt or on their shoulder belts a sheath with a 17-inch long triangular bladed socket bayonet that fits over the muzzle of the weapon. It allows you to keep shooting, but also talks 
turns the gun into a six foot long spear. And cold steel is going to be what is the deciding factor in er almost every 18th century battle. You win, you lay down fire, when one side begins to waver, you go forward and play a charge and drive the enemy from the field. And a 17-inch bayonet is a vicious weapon. You do not want to get a puncture wound from that weapon. It is extremely difficult to sew up. If you think about modern bayonets in the 20th century, um, they're basically knife-like and flat-bladed, which at least allows you to attempt to sew it up easily. Um, in the 18th century, with primitive surgery, not, uh, you, if you got stabbed, there's a very good likelihood that you cause bleed to death from that wound. So you had to learn how to fight with a bayonet. You needed real discipline and determination to go in a bayonet charge or receive a bayonet charge. Um, it's no small thing, and the Americans used citizen soldiers time and time again, the militia, <laughs> to fight uh, for the army, and these men were not trained professionally and didn't know how to use the bayonet, and of course, if they were charged by professionals, there's a good chance that they would break and run. I would certainly consider uh, a, a line of red-coated soldiers coming forward, uh, a steady clip machine line with glistening bayonets. Uh, it's a real challenge to stand around when I could be home looking my cow. So you can see on the right flank that the weight of attack has dropped in the uh, light troops that have been sent out to hopefully delay them. Um, and we have quite a heavy firefight going on. As, as the on, firefight continues, you get to notice that less than half of the muskets are going to be firing. Because even when you fire a blank round, it is still black powder and it still fouls the weapon. For uh, people who uh, enjoy photography, if you watch the tearing it open in their teeth and powder down the barrel, we do not ram down. Do not want to risk having a misfire that could launch a metal ramrod. So you pour the powder down the barrel and then come back up to the floor.